so let's get started because there are like 300 slides here, and I know you want to go to bed tonight. <laughs> Saturday will set at some point, so you won't be able to see it. Um, in the beginning, yeah, if you put the lights out at me, they don't really need to see me. Can you do half, or is it? That's good. No, that's perfect. We like that. Yeah, that's perfect. Can the folks at home see that now better? Uh, yeah, they have better. Great. So this is where it all began. Now, I noticed there are a couple of people in the room that probably are too young to remember this day. Um, <laughs> at least a couple. But um, I, I was only three years old when this happened, and I honestly don't remember this event. But this is this day, October 4th, 1957, was when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik into space. And it was truly the beginning of the space age, because all of a sudden the United States fell pretty far behind the Soviet Union, and we needed to, we needed to pick up the pace a little bit. Um, Sputnik was, um, for the, did anybody hear it? Was anybody doing astronomy? In 1957, when they went out and actually saw Sputnik, because Sputnik was actually a very difficult satellite to observe. It was small and only about sixth magnitude. People that were out and what they saw most likely was the, the upper stage rocket booster that finally lofted the, the satellite into orbit, because the satellite was actually pretty small, um, a sphere about 22 inches in diameter. And um, I don't know if that's the actual one or if just a replica, but this is hanging in the Air and Space Museum in DC. So if you ever down that way, it's a great museum to go to. Of course, it's free, like pretty much every other museum in DC. Look up, and, the, and that model of Sputnik is hanging from the ceiling. Um, the United States has had some rough starts. We, we blew up quite a few rockets on the launch pad, trying to get something into orbit. But, in, um, but on January 31st, 1958, just you know, four, three months later, three months later, four months later, we launched Explorer 1. And this is, this is the satellite. Now, when I first saw that picture, I thought to myself, well, that's a pretty good looking satellite. That's got some, you know, it's, an, it's a pretty good chunk of hardware, right? And I thought that until I saw the next picture, which was, um, that's the scale model. Um, you know, and this was the rocket that ultimately, well, not this, but this is the scale model of the rocket that got this into orbit. That's Verna von Braun. Um, I don't know who these guys are, but that's, that's how big that payload was. It takes a lot of energy to put something into orbit around the Earth. And the early satellites were really pretty small. Um, that's, this is Vanguard 1, which was launched in March of 1958. 6.4-inch aluminum sphere weighed 3.2 pounds. And you can see, you can hold it in your hand. Here they, they're loading it in the top of the rocket. It's the oldest satellite still in Earth orbit. I don't know if anybody's ever seen it, and I have. Um, but you have to really go and look for it because it's faint. It's three, it's 6.4 inches in diameter. And satellites shine by reflected sunlight, right? So, you know, to see that satellite, it's typically 10th, 11th, 12th magnitude. Pretty hard to see, but you've got to know where to look for it. I'll get to that later. Um, but you can go on heavensabove.com, go on their satellite database. It's the first satellite listed. Click on visible passes, and uh, you'll know where to look. More about Heavens Above later. Um, this was my first experience with satellites. My dad dragged us out to the backyard one August night in the summer, uh, in the summer of 1960 because he wanted to see Echo. This was a 100-foot mylar balloon that was in orbit around the Earth, inclined about 47.2 degrees to the equator, so it passed over New England. And they must have posted the Times in the newspaper because that was the best source of information he had, maybe the weather or the news people. He dragged us out. There was heat lightning in the air. Now, that summer, I was six. And my youngest brother that was in tow was probably three. He didn't like the heat lighting. It was crying and putting up a fuss. So my dad dragged us all back in the house. By the time he got back outside, he never saw our satellite go by. He was not happy. He was not happy. But that was my first experience going out. That was the first time I ever looked up at the nighttime sky. Like I said, he sprinkled astronomy on us. Eclipse of the sun in 63. I got to watch an eclipse of the moon in 64. The comet of 65. The Leonids in 66. And so here we are today. I think I saw that. Echo was a bright satellite. Yeah. You can see that pretty easily. I mean, if you knew when to look, but that was the hard part back then. There was no internet. There was no information, really. Um, and so it, knowing when to look was really, really I challenging. There were probably four of us kids who were all between 9 and 11 years old. And we went down to the intersection of one of our streets. And that's where we what that was was to get citizen scientists to go out and observe with telescopes. Um, here you can see four of them right here uh, in a line looking through the same type of telescope that 
it's hard to tell there, but different parts of the sky. Um, watching for a satellite to pass through their field of view. Um, you could build your own satellite scope. This was a, a science and engineering, a science and mechanics magazine from 1958, where you could you could build one if you could find all the necessary parts. Um, making a nine dollar satellite scope, and it's a telescope with a mirror. It worked pretty well, but you could buy them. Now, this was the November 1956 issue of Sky and Telescope. There was actually a little article in that, in that issue about Operation Moonwatch, if you're interested, you can go back and dig that up. Um, but back at, towards the end of the catalog, of the magazine, here was, a cat, here was an advertisement from Edmund Scientific for a satellite scope. You could buy it completely set up for about 50 bucks. That was a lot of money back in the late 50s. Mm -hmm. Think about it, that was a lot of money. Um, or you could buy the components down here for about 20 bucks. Um, Edmund sold um, this, uh, not Edmund, Radio Shack through Micronta, sold this uh, type of a Moonwatch telescope for $32.95. If you, when, when I'm finished, if, the, if you want to come up and look at one, I have one right here. This is my, this is my, it's not mine, it wasn't mine originally. And I don't know if you can see it really well. The folks at home can't see it. But it consists of this low power wide field telescope. In here, there's a mirror, so observers would sit like this, um, and this would be lined up with the meridian. Everybody had their own angle to look at. There's a, let me click the next slide. This is a little kind of a model, yeah. but everybody would stand, would sit in a line, and put, and this is the, mark the meridian, and each telescope on either side was looking at a slightly different but overlapping section of the sky. Um, and they would sit there for probably for hours, waiting and watching and watching. There, on the side, there were people recording. Um, here's a picture of one. Go on, click, click. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Abandon you. Um, I'll use this for the clicker. For the, uh, the, there's a daylight shot of it. And that's how they would do it. There was a recording station here where there was literally a, a tape recorder playing with a timer. And as soon as somebody saw a satellite, they would call it out, and then they would record it. Yes, Steve? Was it mandatory where we were at that time? Or I think it was back then. <laughs> I think it was. If, if you were at Stellafane and you listen to Mario Modest talk about um, the centennial of Stellafane, he, he, he likes to comment that even digging trees out of the ground, those guys all had suits and ties on, um, every, in all the pictures of the old timers up there. When I got this uh, telescope, I um, set it up on my back deck one summer after in Eden, and I just pointed it sort of to the east, and I looked through the eyepiece and focused on the stars, and I thought to myself, you know, somebody literally looked through this. I don't know who owned this one, but somebody looked through this for hours waiting to see a satellite. I must have seen 10 satellites in 15 minutes <laughs> go, through the, um, go through this telescope, and I was like, oh, those poor guys back in the 50s. Uh, but it was, it, was, um, it was citizen science. And that's what they did. Yeah, this little clicker stopped working, didn't it? I'm going to try and connect it back. Hold on. It's just so much more convenient. Maybe it shut it off. Maybe it disconnected. Come on. Maybe the battery's dead. Did it go by itself? Right? Nah. Go this way. This is the teacher in the you, you can't. Nothing fails. You just you just go to Plan B. Yes, sir. Uh, that scope there, is that part of the Seesaw program? Oh, I don't know. I, I know it was a Project Moonwatch scope. Um, well, there's a program called Seesaw, and I had one of those scopes back in 57, 58. Okay. And it's a program called Seesaw. And when you're watching a bunch of people, when they first see something, they saw the sea. And when it goes out of view, it's solved. Oh, so they can time it. Yeah. It's called a seesaw. Okay. It's probably similar, very probably just what those folks were doing. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Well, most of us probably already know this, but launching a satellite is a lot like shooting a cannonball out of a cannon, right? If I shoot a cannon out and I aim the projectile at the horizon, of course, it'll go a certain distance before gravity pulls it down to the surface of the Earth, right? If I want to shoot the cannonball farther away, I've got to increase the velocity so that it has it travels a longer distance before gravity pulls it down from the surface of the Earth. If I shoot the cannonball fast enough, 
I can, I can send it on this trajectory here at a, at a speed at which it never quite falls to the surface of the Earth because at a particular altitude, a particular speed, the curvature of the Earth falls away from the projectile as it tries to fall back to the Earth. In essence, the satellite is falling around the Earth. And when you look at the astronauts on board the space station, they're, they, they're weightless, right? They're not massless, but they're weightless. They're in free fall all the time, which is why they can float around the inside of the ISS uh, like they do. They're constantly in a state of free fall. And that's how you put a satellite into orbit. You put it into that sort of a scenario at the right altitude, at the right speed to make it do that. If you give it enough energy, you can, um, you can get your satellite to leave Earth orbit if you uh, approach escape velocity and send it off to wherever you want it to go. So it's very common to see satellites put into a, an, a, an e, a west to east orbit because they're cashing in on the rotation of the Earth. A lot of, you'll see uh, Kennedy Space Center is at latitude 28 and a half degrees. French Guiana is very close to the equator. You want your satellite, you want your rockets to be close to the equator and heading out to the east most of the time to minimize the energy. We're all sitting in this room. It doesn't feel like we're moving, but we're traveling east at about 700 miles an hour, right, as the Earth turns on its axis. And so you want to, the rocket engineers want to catch in on that energy that's already in the rocket. And so that's why they launch them in this direction. Um, a, a, oops. a typical um, orbit might look something like this, where um, here's the orbital plane of the, of the satellite. Um, the inclination is the angle this plane makes with the, with the Earth equator. If the orbit's elliptical in nature, it's going to have a perigee point where it's closest to the surface of the Earth and an apogee point where it's farthest away, away, apogee, <laughs> A, right? Um, it's the inclination that tends to be important because depending on what your satellite's mission is, inclination allows you to look at more or less of the surface of the Earth. If you incline a satellite to only 30 degrees from the equator, then the satellite will pass over only parts of the Earth between plus 30 and negative 30 latitude. If you want to see more of the Earth, you raise your inclination up. So in this scenario here, a satellite will pass over every place overhead from 60 degrees north to 60 degrees south. If you really want to see the entire Earth, you put your satellite in a polar orbit. So as the Earth rotates under that orbital plane, satellite over enough over a given amount of time will look down at the entire surface of the Earth. This is great for Earth observatories, reconnaissance satellites, um, whatever the mission is. See a lot of polar satellites. If you go out most nights and watch satellites go by, most of them are in polar orbits. Um, depending on what they want to do with it. And so here's one last look at um, inclination. The reason we didn't see a lot of the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo stuff up here is because the Kennedy Space Center is at a latitude of 28 and a half degrees. So most of all of that stuff was going on in this part of the world, and we were just too far north to see much of it. The space station is inclined at... 51.6 degrees above the equator, which is why it makes nice passes over New England all the time. The Chinese space station is inclined, I think, 43 degrees to the Earth's equator, which is why we see it all the time. Um, so there you go. But I'll push that button a thousand times tonight. Um, lighting is important. When you want to go out and observe satellites, you have to be mindful of the lighting. A satellite needs to be up in the sunlight. And ideally, you need to be in the darkness or pretty close to it. And so the very best times year-round to watch satellites are during dusk and dawn, when the sky is still dark enough, but you can see the stars and you can see the satellites up in the sunlight. In the daytime, of course, um, it's really tough to see satellites because you're standing in broad daylight. In the middle of the night, you typically can't see satellites because they're buried in this well of Earth's shadow. Um, <laughs> There are um, seasonal uh, sort of things to consider. Here in the Northern Hemisphere, at 42 degrees north latitude, we're about right here. Here's the North Pole, here's the equator, we're about halfway up. So in the summertime, when the North Pole of the Earth is tilted towards the sun, the shadow of the Earth at local midnight, the sun's only 24 degrees below the horizon on June 21st, right, the solstice. And so the shadow of the Earth, passing right over us is actually relatively shallow, which means that satellites that are, you know, 
to 300 miles high are in the, in the sunlight all night long. So if, your favorite, if you're a satellite observer, your favorite night of the year is probably June 21st because you can see satellites all night long. So you can try it sometime. In the wintertime, on the other side of the game, the wintertime side over here, we're deep in that shadow of the Earth. And so it's rare to see satellites during the middle of the night in the wintertime just because they're never in the sunlight. So those are some things to think about when you go out and look for satellites. And a typical pass looks something like this. You know, your satellite, This in this case, it's the International Space Station, might appear in the west-southwest, 10 degrees above the horizon, traveling up, 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 reaching a maximum height, in this case, of 66 degrees, continuing along, disappearing at 31 degrees above the northeastern horizon. We all know why they disappear, right? They pass into the shadow of the Earth. Now, here's homework assignment number one. <laughs> number one. The next time the space station, so in a couple of weeks, starts to make a good evening passes over New England. So if you own a pair of binoculars or a telescope, binoculars work for this. I want you to watch the space station as it starts to enter the Earth's shadow. Now, for a moment, imagine you're an astronaut on board the space station, and you're looking out that big, beautiful window they have to look out, and you look towards the setting sun. And as soon as the sun dips below the horizon, what, what's left for them to see? The twilight colors, right? the oranges and yellows. And very often, space station, especially with the light gathering power of a pair of binoculars, takes on a nice orange color. It's the reflection of those sunlight, uh, those sunset colors. So uh, that's your first home of your sun. If you've never done that before, check that out. That's kind of neat to see. There's only, there's only one more homework assignment coming, but anyway, that's the first. Um, there, the homework is, in my class is pretty easy. So where do you get the information? You know, back in the 1960s, you could go out and look at the few satellites that went by, but there was literally no information available. You literally just went outside and looked up and, oh, there's a satellite. Half an hour later, oh, there's another one. But now we have this thing called the Internet, right? And the Internet is a miracle because all you have to do is ask it a question, and you, you would typically get about 1.2 million answers, right? The first one or two hits are probably your best bet. And my favorite place to get information, and probably yours too, heavensabove.com. It's been around for at least 20 years. Man, you can set your clock by this website. And once you click on this, the first thing you should do is to go here and change your observing location. And you can, um, you can take it from a list. You can, um, you can take it from a map. And once you bookmark the site, it will remember your observing location forevermore. Yeah. And so what I did for... Oh, look, it worked. There we go. Um, I put in 47 Peep Toad Road, North Citra, Rhode Island, and there we are. And so when I bookmark this, when I say, yes, that's my observing location, the predictions are set for here, right in this yard out here. And so like I said, you can really set your watch by these things. You can set it for anywhere you want in the world, and um, it, it gives some pretty good, see, now it's not working. <laughs> It gives some pretty good information. So coming up in about uh, two weeks, I picked this one in particular because it just was a nice high pass. So on September 13th, beginning at 8.52 and 20 seconds, the ISS will be 10 degrees above the west-southwestern horizon. A few minutes later, it will be 61 degrees up in the west, and at the same time, it will be disappearing. The pass ends 20, um, 8.55 and 11 seconds, 61 degrees above the west. It's visible. Minus magnitude 3.4. That's wow. pretty bright. Yes. Remember, the stage, space station is big. It's about the size of a football field. And so it's reflecting quite a bit of sunlight. And so if you click on September 13th or any other one of these nights, what the next thing you're, you're, you're given is a, a sky chart. So now you don't have to guess where it is in the sky, for real. I think my dad's problem that night in August back in 1960 was he really didn't know where to look. And there's no advertising. They're not marking their horn when they go by. So you have to sort of know where to look. And I think when I first got into this game, when the internet was new, there were nights when the space station went right behind me. I was like, Grr. But then heavensabove.com came out with maps. Now I can go out and go, oh, oh, I know exactly in the sky where to look. And what, what happens right here? It enters the shadow of the Earth. So the space station is a really fun one to watch. And once you've seen it once and you know what it looks like, 
then you can actually, you'll be out observing and go, oh, oh, there's the space station. I got it. If you can just tell by the way it moves across the sky, the way how bright it is, and, the, and usually the path across the sky will tell you it's the space station. There are other websites. There are tons of apps to go out and to let you know when to go out and look at the space station. This is another one, just real-time satellite tracking and predictions. So there are lots of tools available to us today that make observing satellites way more interesting, I think, than even 10 years ago. Is that your question? Yeah, I'm just going to tell a story about ISS yep. observation. Uh, one of our members, Bob Horton, works at Brown University. And he got a call from a student and said, can I come and use your telescope to observe the space station from the Brown Observatory? And Bob said, well, we're not going to be able to use the telescope because the space moves so fast, but come on over and I will show you where it is. So they came over, she brought her brother, and they both set up at the right time, and it was clear that night, fortunately. Tell me, why are you interested in looking at the space station tonight? She said, because my dad is the commander right now. Nice. <laughs> nice. And it doesn't move. So, um, you know, as far as this goes, like what goes up? So um, this is an interesting map showing um, the trajectory on launch of uh, the space shuttles when they visited the International Space Station. So they launched out of the Kennedy Space Center. Um, they came literally up the East Coast. Now, um, I don't know if you all ever did this, but let me see if I got it to work. I guess work. Yeah. Um, those solid rocket boosters are two minutes. They're barely out of the Kennedy Space Center. They're they've not even hardly gotten anywhere by the time this, the solid rockets came off that thing. But but if it was a nighttime launch. You could uh, up here at about T plus seven minutes when they're off the coast of the Carolinas, you could actually see them coming up over the southwestern horizon. And they would come up across the sky. Um, you could watch them until Miko um, telescopically. I thought the exhaust usually, I, candle flame orange, the flying V. Remember those guitars, the flying V guitars? Mm -hmm. That's what the exhaust pool looked like in the telescope. The only thing I never did, oh, I wanted to put a reticle in the eyepiece so I could get a quick angular size of the, the plume to calculate how big it actually was. Because those gases coming out of the nozzle of the main engines, there's 5,000 degrees C. In the vacuum of space, they did this. And I used to say to folks, somewhere in that, right near the point of that V, the shuttle's in there. And you could watch it all the way up to Miko. Um, and then even after that, because what they would then do is they would release the main fuel tank. Right, that was just a piece of debris that burned up back in the atmosphere. But they would maneuver the orbital maneuvering rockets. They would fire bursts of those rockets to um, maneuver away from the fuel tank and fine tune their orbit. And I used to tell folks that that part looks like fire, a firefly going across the sky. You would see flash, 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 and then nothing, and then flash, flash, flash over here as they headed off into the east. It was pretty cool to watch those guys. The show lasted a, a whopping like two and a half minutes, but um, you could certainly see them. Um, don't forget Wallops Island. Wallops Island, Virginia's got a, a pretty active rocket port, and they do some really nice launches out of there as well. Um, uh, I, I think I have this ever so slightly out of um, out of sequence, but stay, Rocket Monkey, do you know that app, website app? Um, it's a space launch schedule. It's the best site to go to these days to know when they're going to throw something up into, the, into space. And so... Um, uh, <laughs> And that's that's the little icon of the app. It's a little rocket monkey. And yeah, there was one of the uh, rocket launches from uh, Wallops Island, from Rutland. You could see the second state uh, ignition with the the donut. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna show that picture. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. It's so cool. But the nice thing about the nice thing about space launch schedule is they also give you a trajectory. Now this was a Starlink launch uh, <laughs> last week, or just the other day, out of Vandenberg um, Air Force Base in California. We're interested in the ones that come up the East Coast. But you're right. Um, here's the, this was the Laddie launch. That's the one you're talking about, Russ. Um, I can't believe it's been 10 years. Um, my son, uh, Sean, used to live in D.C. And he was up on his roof um, with me on the phone. Uh, this got delayed into the evening, about 1130 at night. They finally lifted off. He was my eyes in the sky in oh. D.C. Because he only lived 120 miles from, uh, from Wallace. And he's, we're on the phone, it's like nothing, nothing, nothing. And all of a sudden he went crazy. 
because he could see this brilliant dot of light come up next to the Washington Monument, arc out over the Atlantic Ocean. So I told a group of people I was with, I said, all right, it's off the pad. Now get ready. So this is what Chris Cook from um, Cape Cod caught the picture of. Now, the first stage was sort of not visible from, from here, but there's the second stage burn. And this particular one, there was a 19 second coast period to go from here to the third stage ignition. And I told the folks, I had binoculars, and I said, look, if you've, if, you've, if you've ever followed a satellite, what I want you to do is follow the, follow the satellite. When the engine goes out, make believe you're still following it. And then 19 seconds, which will seem like a long time, if you've done your, if you've done your trail tracking well, you'll see the third stage ignite. And when the third stage ignited, I don't know how well you can see it, there, it blew out this smoke ring that Russ, you were talking about. Yeah. And so, remember, I had binoculars, and so I would watch the rocket, and this was a big, smoky exhaust trail. And I would come back down the exhaust trail, see the ring getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It was very cool. Now, this was a big honking rocket, because this lighting was going to the moon. Um, but it was a beautiful launch, um, and we got to see it rather nicely up here. So don't discount wallops. If, if Space Monkey or Rocket Monkey tells you there's a wallops launch at night, that may well be something that you want to go out and look at. Now, just to go back to Chris Cook's picture, I mean, there's the, there's the handle of the teapot of Sagittarius, just to give you some idea of, of how, here's Capricornus in here. So it's, it was pretty low in the sky, but actually not so bad. Here's the horizon. Uh, maybe, maybe that's the horizon right there, but there you go. Um, it was really a nice launch, um, and I was really glad I got to see it. And oftentimes, Wallops Island will give you maps like this. Now, look, the, the purple area we're up here, the altitude, somewhere between 5 and 10 degrees. This particular rocket launch went out to the southeast. That might have been a uh, resupply ship to the space station. Uh, could be anything. But Wallops Island does launch a fair amount of rockets. All right, so what goes up? We have that covered. Let's see what goes down. There's atmospheric drive, even 250 miles above the surface of the Earth, and the space station feels it. Now, this is an old chart, but we, I could have just pulled down today's, and these are the ups and downs of the space station. Atmospheric drag, let's boost it up a kilometer or two. Atmospheric drag, boost it up, boost it up, boost it up. And so they do that all routinely as orbital maintenance just to keep atmospheric drag where they want it so it's manageable. Otherwise, over enough time, the space station would burn up in the atmosphere of the Earth. And that's how they've gotten rid of some of the old space stations in the past. They, they intentionally deorbit them over the Pacific Ocean. Um, if you're interested in reentries, there's a website, Aerospace, um, just, just Aerospace Rocket Reentries. And they've got a great site that gives predictions for when things are going to fall back to the Earth. Now, that's a little bit harder to predict. And so what they'll give you is a chart that looks like this. This one was for Starlink 1299. The yellow track is the projected orbit that the decay will take place in. So if you, if you knew in advance that this was the trajectory, you wouldn't waste your time going out to look at it from here in New England because you're not going to see that. But sometimes they pass over the Earth. And sometimes the warnings are a little bit more dire. The, uh, the early on Chinese space station uh, was involved in an uncontrolled re-entry, which means they had nothing to do with it. Atmospheric drag was just taking over. And sooner or later, it was going to fall out of the sky. And it was a big piece of hardware. And it's a little hard to tell here, but humans could climb in and out of this docking port over here. So it was a pretty good sized chunk of stuff. And all this area of green was the primary or the potential landing area for debris with a, you know, a bit of scatter at the top and bottom. So, you know, New England was not beyond the gun sight. Oh, I would love to have a piece of thing fall in my backyard. Oh, you know how much that would be worth? That would be worth a ton of money. <laughs> so, you know, every now and then there are big things. That's a shuttle fuel tank over some farmland, most likely in Europe. Um, glorious piece of hardware that when it re-entered the atmosphere, there was quite a display. This was taken from Hawaii in the early days of the shuttle program. And so if you're out and about, you look up at the sky and you see this sort of shower of sparks that look like it could be a thousand meteors, it's most likely it's a rocket re-entry. And as each piece um, falls, as it falls apart, each little piece is burning up in the atmosphere, producing a, a, its own little meteoric uh, path. Um, pretty short-lived, but and relatively rare, but they do happen. Um, 
There are curious satellites, Ed White's glove that floated out of the Gemini capsule in 1965, um, wasn't in orbit long, but every now and then when I see a really faint satellite in my telescope, I think about Ed White's glove, you know, and I wonder how small is this little satellite that I'm watching in my eyepiece? You know, it's hard to tell because you can't really know for sure what it is. Um, the tool bag. Now, this, this slide right here was a movie. I don't know if it is or not. I almost don't want to push the button because I'm afraid if I do, it'll stop everything in its tracks. Time is it. It's too late to watch movies. Yes? You mentioned the falling out of orbit. But um, on occasion, when the space shuttles were launched, they would come over the East Coast pretty close to Rhode Island. And um, as they finally get up to or almost orbital altitude, um, and they're not quite clear of the atmosphere, there's a danger of them sort of tumbling. And if, if you have a telescope and you can watch it over there, you can see jets flaring. The maneuver angels, yep. That's the stabilizer to make sure they're always pointed in the same yep. direction. That's what those firefly bursts were a part of. Yep. Uh, yeah. Making sure it's right where they want it. Yeah, there's a monopropeller. Can you see that on the, have you looked at the crew dragons? Can you see that on those? Can you see it on the SpaceX Crew Dragon launches with crews to the space station? I haven't, I haven't tried to see it yet with those, but. Oh, I've only seen it on the show. That'll be my homework. Yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not going to show you the video of the tool bag because I'm afraid it won't play, right? But the tool bag, they, they lost it. It's just a few hundred thousand dollars worth of tools. <laughs> on that one. Once it drifted away, that was the end of that. Um, my favorite curious satellite was the tethered satellite experiment um, from the space shuttle back probably in the 1990s. The original mission was to unravel about 20 miles of, of conductor and pass it through the Earth's magnetic field in an attempt to generate electricity. The first attempt, there was a, a somebody didn't talk to somebody else, and there was a little screw that kind of jammed the mechanism. So it only went out for a little ways, and it, it got stuck. So they reeled it back in, brought it back home. I mean, that's what the shuttle was good for, right? And then they fixed it, and they put it back up again. But what happened was after about 12 miles of cable had been released, there were, it was generating current, and it was generating probably more than they thought. There was a short circuit, and it broke. The cable actually broke. And so the shuttle folks were pretty nervous, actually, because, whoops, back this way. The shuttle pe people were a little nervous because there's 12 miles worth of cable pretty close to the space shuttle, and they just released it. And it got all coiled up. This was visible not from the Wingland, but the southern tier states in the United States. You could see that. It was 12 miles long. You could see it. It was pretty cool. Um, and so and then we get to the flashers. Um, the Aries flasher from 1985. Anyone remember the stories of that? There was a group of amateurs that spotted this flare in the sky. And they originally, because it was during a, the early days of gamma ray bursts, and they thought they might have witnessed a gamma ray burst. Um, and so um, they published articles in Sky and Telescope magazine and put people on alert. Um, but what it turned out to be, um, just like the iridium flares uh, that came a little bit later on, it was just a glint of sunlight off a satellite. Um, it, it had nothing to do with gamma ray bursts. It was just the, the, just the rare coincidence that they happened to see a bright flash off a satellite. This is what the iridium satellites look like. These original ones are no longer in orbit. So iridium flares aren't happening anymore. But sunlight re would reflect off these antennas. And sometimes iridium flares would reach minus ninth magnitude. Wow. You can see, you could actually see them in the daytime if you knew just where to look. Um, as the, as the brightness you peaked up, you'd see it and then it would go right away again. Russ, do you have a question? No, well, I was going to say to go back to one of your other slides. Back in 1980, I had a chance to go to a uh, whole lake Air Force base up in Alberta. And they had the Bacon Nun satellite tracking camera. Oh, sure. They wouldn't let me take a picture, but you can walk in and see it. And now there's so many amateurs have equipment that's equal to it. Oh, unbelievable. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. Well, there are the iridium flashers. Um, there are secret satellites, of course. Were any of you at Stellafane the year the, the, the NOS triplet passed over Stellafane? Come on, guys. If you want to keep a satellite secret, do not pass it over a field with 2,000 amateur astronomers. <laughs> I mean, seriously? Seriously? That was all over the feeble early incident in the days afterwards. The NOS satellites were, uh, they were radio interferometers. 
that the Navy was operating. They were tethered together. They were actually tethered together. They moved together as a, as a constellation. Um, and they were, they were looking for ships and, and especially submarines out of the water using radio interferometry. Was that the three satellite configuration? Yeah. There are doubles now. Uh, they're not tethered anymore because they have better technology, but they used to be wired together. So they would, they would, they would cruise along in space. Oh, I love the secret, um, the, the, the spy satellites, the keyhole satellites. Keyhole satellites, like USA-186, which you can find on heavensabove.com, so much being secret, are thought to be Hubble Space Telescope-sized telescopes looking down at the Earth as reconnaissance satellites. Now, I'm not going to say the three-letter acronym that rhymes with C-I-A, but they're alleged to be the ones that know this guy. Um, Naval intelligence. And, uh, and you know, there's a, a human, to, but there's a secret. We don't really know for sure what they look like. Um, but they're thought to be Hubble Space Telescopes looking down at the Earth. And, and think about what a Hubble I've Space Telescope that's pretty could, could see, you know? Yeah, I've been told the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So keyhole satellites, this, this X-37B space plane. I mean, as soon as they launch one of those secret satellites, <laughs> it's on heavensabove.com within an hour. Uh, because satellite observers are all over this kind of stuff. The mission's a secret, but you can see this guy go by. It's pretty nice, actually. It's like a little mini space uh, shuttle. Yeah. Pretty cool. Well, so the ones that don't move, this is one of my very, very favorite sub-hobbies to astronomy on the geostationary satellites. One night, I was looking at M11, the wild duck cluster. Everybody is very familiar with that, right? Most people are in the room are. The wild duck cluster is a lovely galactic cluster. I it's one of my very favorites. And one night, as I was looking at the Wild Earth Cluster, a little satellite drifted through the field. And because I like satellites, for the most part, when a little satellite drifts through the field, I think Ed White's glove, and I think, well, maybe I'll follow it, especially if I'm looking at something I can go back to east. So I started to sort of follow this little satellite, and I suddenly realized that while it looked like it was moving through the star field, it actually wasn't. It was the star field drifting past it because it was a geostationary satellite. So that was my very first one. And so I start to do my homework. I start to read about geostationary satellites and how do you observe them. There are hundreds of them um, encircling most of the Earth. There, there, there aren't many over the Pacific Ocean because there's really nothing for them to do there. The ones we see are all in here. There are lots of them. There are the TV satellites, the telephone satellites, the Internet satellites, reconnaissance satellites. They do all kinds of stuff. But how do you find them? Right? Because most geostationary satellites are about 11th to 12th magnitude most of the time. Around the equinoxes, this is a good time to pay attention to the part of the sky where they hang out. A lot of times near the equinoxes, you'll actually get specular reflections of sunlight off the satellites. I've seen geostationary satellites reach naked eye magnitude, magnitude 3, magnitude 2. If, and if you, so if you know your constellations and you happen to be out and you happen to notice a stationary star that isn't moving, put your telescope on there. See what it's doing. I bet it's a geostationary satellite. So how, but how do you find them on any other night? Hand them off the pass. That's a trick I learned early on uh, when I was trying to find this particular asteroid. Um, 2005 YU55 was about 12th magnitude. So I got a big honking telescope at home. 12th magnitude is easy for it, right? But finding a 12th magnitude star amongst all the other 12th magnitude stars is really hard to do. So my son and I were out there frustrated by trying to find this little speck of light moving through the star fields. And we, we couldn't do it. And I suddenly went, ah, I know what to do. We'll head it off at the pass. So this was a map, a chart published by Sky and Telescope that showed the trajectory of the asteroid across our skies. See this little group of stars right here? That's how I did it. I went to this asterism about 30 minutes before this asteroid passed by that asterism and just waited for it to come to me. And that's a really good way to find a geostationary satellite. Find a nice group of stars that you like to sit on and wait for them to come to you. Now, if you have a planetarium program in your phone, like, a, uh, like Stellarium or I use Sky Safari Pro, I can call up these geostationary satellites and they'll show me exactly, it'll show me right where they are in the sky. So it makes heading them off the pass a little bit easier. I'm going to give you my secret. Are you ready? Don't tell anybody about this. <laughs> Finding asteroids is 
That's a good way to find asteroids. Head them off at the pass. Finding geostationary satellites, head them off at the pass. So let's go back to that favorite cluster of mine, M11, the wild duck cluster, easy to find, right? You see it in binoculars. You'll see it in your finder scope. When you zoom in on the on this is from Sky Safari Pro. Here it is right here in all of its glory, right? Um, this is inverted for telescopic view. See this little asterism right here? It looks like a Christmas tree, right? I call it the Christmas tree. And you know why I call it that? Because every now and then there are presents there. And the presents that are there are geostationary satellites because the, 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 the geostationary satellites are above the Earth's equator. With parallax for us here at this latitude, that arc of geostationary satellites is a declination about minus six degrees and 20 arc minutes. And it turns out that the Christmas tree is right at minus six degrees and 20 arc seconds of declination. So as the night goes by, the Christmas tree rises in the east, moves across the sky, and it cuts through this swath of sky where the geostationary satellites are parked. And so that's my head them off at the pass. I love to go, this is easy to find, that's easy to find. And I watch this area of the sky. Now, sometimes I'll drift over this way to look for them coming. Sometimes if I miss any, I see them over here. But that's where I go to look for geostationary satellites. And I've got these little asterisms all the way home across the whole sky. So that in the springtime, when this isn't up, I've got one in Virgo that I use. Um, or, you know, in the fall, I've got another one I use over in Aquarius. And I have these little waypoints in the sky that I go to, and I wait for these geostationary satellites to come to me. And they're fun to watch because if you go back, if I go back a couple of slides, oh, too many slides. I'll get to another, find another picture over here. Well, there's what it looks like. Right? It, as the stars trail through the eyepiece field, um, it, it's literally parked. Just shut your drive off or let the Dobsonian just sit where it is and ask people you're going to show not to bang the telescope because it'll be hard to find that little speck again. But you can see them. Now, this is a, an 8-inch scope here. This may be a little bit small in the aperture department. Well, she got really dark skies because these things, like I said, are about 11th, 12th, 13th magnitude most nights. They're small. We could probably get four or five in the room. They're 23,000 miles above the equator, so they're pretty far away. So that's why they're faint. Um, this telescope has a theoretical magnitude, limiting magnitude of about 13 and a half, right? Typical 8-inch reflector. But a, a more practical limiting magnitude is probably down around 11, where it's comfortable. You, you're straining your eyes to look at something magnitude 13 and a half. It's there, I can't tell. But 11 magnitude is easy to look at this. So some of the bright ones you might be able to actually pick up in an 8-inch. I, I think a little more aperture makes it easier to spot them. But once you find them, there they are. And I, I, my favorites are the Amazonas uh, satellites that are parked over the east coast of Brazil. So you can look those up on Heavens Above, on heavensabove.com. You can look them up on um, uh, Sky Safari Pro, for example. What I like about them is there are four of them clustered together right next to each other in space. There's Amazonas 3, 2, 3, 5, and they just put a new one up there called Amazonas Next. So what you can see when you look in the eyepiece field of view, are four satellites that are just sitting there as the stars stream across the ID field of view. It's a weird illusion when you first see it. I tell people, look for satellites that look at stars that look like they're drifting through the ID field of view. It's a weird illusion. And then I'll go, that's them. And watch, they're not moving. Everything else is drifting by them. So it's kind of fun. And I, that, I would encourage you, that's sort of a middle of the road homework assignment. But they're fun to watch. Anyway, they're in the space station. I've saved the best for last. Yes, sir. Have you ever tried to image the uh, Webb Space Telescope? You know, no. It's stationary. No, it's not as stationary as you think it is. The James Webb Space Telescope is out at LaGrange, too, right? Mm -hmm. In a weird three dimensional halo orbit. The orbit looks like a Pringles chip on um, a weird, like, saddle. It's a weird orbit. I um, mean, it's the best orbit to keep the James Webb Telescope at L2 with minimal input from the ground. So there's about 10 years worth of whatever gas they're pushing it around with. They have to make little adjustments because L2 is a quasi-stable yeah. gravitational point. The satellite won't stay there by itself. Yeah, it's not like L4 or it's L5. No, L4 and 5 are stable. Yeah. But L2 and L1, didn't the India just park a, a telescope or it's on its way to L1? Mm -hmm. The solar telescope they just launched like yesterday the day before? That's going to L1. Mm -hmm. That's a million miles to the, facing the sun. L2 is a million miles out the other way. So 
I asked the engineers down at that Space Telescope Institute, they're the ones that control the Webb Telescope, Can we, will, we be able, will we be able to see it? Because I thought, look, you've got that big solar shield that's the size of a tennis court. Maybe we'll be able to see that. That would be fun. And they said, probably not. We think it will shine at about magnitude 20 most of the time. But, there's a, but there are websites where you can tell where it is. You can know where it is. Well, I've taken some images of it and watched it actually move. Have you found it? A couple of hours. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's around 17th, 18th magnitude. Yeah, it's faint. And you can see it actually trace a, a curve around the L. Oh, interesting. That's a pretty big halo orbit. It's only a million miles. It's a pretty big halo orbit. It's only it's a million miles away, but it's a big orbit. Yeah. So, but in a couple cool. hours, you can see a slight it, uh, moving a little bit. Okay. Motion. And it's a it's it's actually the the that halo is actually really big in the sky. If you look at the dimensions of it, I think it's like eight hundred thousand miles in radius. It's big. Hmm. Um, and I think it takes six months to loop around once. But there are websites you can look up. Where's the James Webb Space Telescope? Huh? I'll tell you right where it is. Um, but I don't know if many of us have telescopes like to. Geostationary satellite. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, it would be, sure. Remember, L2 is always on the ecliptic, just to give you some sort of a heads up. So Skylab, long gone, near, long gone. But those are two big space stations that we could see because they were big. Um, but nowadays we have the International Space Station, my all-time favorite um, space station to observe. Look, it's as big as a football field. That's why it's so bright in the sky. Um, and the Chinese space station is pretty big, too. They just added some stuff to it, and it's a fairly big satellite. This shines out about first magnitude if, if the lighting conditions are favorable. Um, but go, let's go back to the space station, because this is, this is the real homework assignment. The real homework assignment is if you've never used your telescope to look at the space station, that's your homework assignment. Don't go big on the magnification. If you're using a telescope bigger than eight inches, put a moon filter in, okay? It's minus fourth magnitude, right? You don't want to be swamped by glare. So pop the moon filter into the telescope. Try to catch the space station when it's far away. The best passes to do this are either the ones that are coming across the sky relatively low, so you can just move the telescope like this and walk with it as you move to the telescope, or the ones that come straight up overhead. But when it's overhead, don't even try with the Dobsonian because you've got to flip it oh, through yeah. the meridian, right? It's, it's bad. But the nice thing about the overhead passes is that you can see them way far away. And so when you can see them way far away, they're coming up like this slowly, moving a little bit across the sky every you know, second. It's much easier to keep them in the eyepiece field. They're 800 miles away, so it's smaller. But you can see the you can see solar panels, you can see the modules. Oh, it's so cool. I don't see it looks like that. And you got to be good at moving it there are some telescopes that promise they'll, they'll track the station, but I've never tried it. If my little me ETX can't find M13, I don't know how it's going to lock onto the space station. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. I haven't tried yet, but ground-based images. Look at that. That was Ron Dantowitz at the Clay Center um, in, in, uh, um, just outside of Boston. Oh, yeah. um, although he and um, his buddy, um, uh, Mark, I uh, can never pronounce his last name. We'll just leave it at Mark. Uh, uh, Ron and Mark developed the software that um, really crisped up the images. Um, the, those, remember those same people with the secret satellites? They actually came and talked to those guys about, mm -hmm. we want to know what you're doing because we don't like it. You can see things like that in the ground. I believe it is, but we don't really have, they stopped doing Astronomy Day. Yeah. Um, I, it's, I, I think um, um, Kai Kai, one of our members, uh, teaches there. Um, but I, I, we, I, I don't think they're doing any public stuff there anymore. I don't think it's well. Like it wasn't when Ron ran the place, but it's a nice facility. Millions and millions and millions of dollars into that system. But um, you know, you can watch ISS transits, and just to give you some idea of scale, I mean, here's a you know shots of the ISS crossing the moon. You can Tycho, you can see that with your naked eye, sort of. You yeah. certainly see in a pair of binoculars. Um, so the space station is big. Um, like I said, football field. Um, when it's overhead, it's um, only 260 miles away. Um, uh, there are solar transits. Um, this was, uh, I don't know which mission this was, but of course there's a set of space shuttle silhouetted up against the, the ISS on the disk of the sun. So you have to imagine that every time the ISS passes across over the United States during the day, there must exist a path on the ground 
where if you happen to be standing in there, you would see a transit, right? Right place, right time, yes? And when I started thinking about that when, during the early days of the internet, I could basically just only come reasonably close. But now, there's this website, ISS Transit Find. Uh, uh, see, <laughs> the internet's a miracle, I'm telling you. So um, this is set for here, um, I think. Yeah, but you can auto detect, it'll, it knows where this computer is, and it will automatically load in the latitude and longitude, you push calculate, and it tells you stuff like this. So I, I said, okay, I, I want to be at 47 Peep Toad Road. And so there we are. Um, so these predictions are for Peep Toad Road. So it turns out next Wednesday morning at 7 11, 25.68 seconds, the Chinese space station is going to transit the sun. So if you were so inclined, here we are here. Here's the center line, not far from you. How far are we? 5.19 kilometers from the center line. If you set up a solar telescope and filter and set your, your, your iPhone, watch the time very carefully. Because I don't know if you can see it, but the duration of this is 3.07 seconds. <laughs> right, remember, these guys are moving along in five miles a second. So they're not waiting around for us. Um, don't blink. What I usually do is I give myself about 15 seconds head start in a clock-driven telescope, right? Heavily filtered, right? You don't want to, don't mess with the sun. Well, you know what you're doing. And sure, it was for the ISS. Sure enough, I gave a little countdown and right across the sun it went. It was so cool. So if you're, if you are so inclined that you have lunar transits and solar transits and near passes, so you could, if you were, you could take your telescope, drive to where you wanted to go, where you want to be, and you could set it up. You could be on the center line if you want. You could be anywhere you want. And that makes, that's a nice thing. And so I say the worst for last, or maybe the best. Um, I know we're all going to start to boo and hiss and start to throw lettuce and <laughs> take our beads and rattles out and shake them at the sky. Because Elon Musk and, and Amazon and a bunch of other com companies are planning these mega constellations. And Elon Musk is well on his way. There are more now, but as of July, um, there were he had 4,519 satellites in low Earth orbit, with 40,000 or more planned. The goal is to provide high-speed, low-latency internet access for everybody. Think about what the internet really does. It brings us to places where we spend money, right? And I know a lot of astronomers don't like the Starlink constellations, and I mean, I get it. But I mean, I, I say to my buddies in Atmob, well, um, call them up. Call Elon up, and maybe you could talk to him nice, and he'll stop. Gotta do that. They're, it's like the Wild West up there for these constellations. No one's there. No, ain't no rules in night fight, right? So he's just launching these satellites up. But have you ever seen a Starlink train go by? They're majestic, to say the least. Um, they look like that. I got a different word for them. You have one. I have a different word for them. Well, of course we all do. Yes, of course. But you know, you know, look, here's the deal. When they started to put mercury vapor lights up and sodium vapor lights, and we were all complaining about that, we had to adapt, right? Mm -hmm. And so light pollution filters came up to help us out greatly with mercury vapor and sodium vapor. I don't know what we're going to do about the LED thing, but, but I think we're going to have to learn to adapt with these guys because there's nothing stopping the folks from sending them out. And soon enough, there'll be hundreds of thousands of these things. It'll be like a chain link fence around the Earth. You won't be able to turn a telescope in any direction without seeing satellites. Um, but in the meantime, and because your friends are going to think we're being invaded from outer space when they, when they accidentally see something like this crossing the sky, where there are 50 satellites in a tight train moving across the sky, I think it looks really neat to see that. I get it. There's a problem. I understand that. But just as a casual backyard observer, I kind of stand there and go, wow, look at that. Now, I've observed quite a few of these trains go by, and it seems like they're launching every week or so. And if the lighting conditions are just right, it's, it's been only a couple of days since the launch, they're going to make a nice pass over New England, and the lighting is right. And when I say the lighting is right, I mean, where, how much, where is the sunlight coming from to illuminate these objects? If you've ever watched a space station go by, you know when it's coming towards you in the evening, it tends to be faint, right? Because you're looking at mostly the nighttime side of the space station, right? Because the other side is the side that the sun is hitting. But as soon as they go by the, the, you know, the meridian, I guess, and head to the other part of the sky, they typically brighten up. 
because now you're looking at the fully illuminated side of the space station. Well, I'm pretty sure we get the same effect with these guys. Now, I know Musk has tried to make them darker, but the new generation, the minis, are not mini or they're bigger, um, and they're, they're not as easily shielded, so they're going to be, still be bright. But um, they are like 50 satellites being towed by a rope, and um, they do look pretty amazing. Um, and so if you, if you know what past is coming, you may want to treat your natives to it. This, when this is rising up out of the west in the evening skies, it looks like a faint little jet contrail coming up from the horizon. And that's what I say to the folks that I'm showing. You're going to love this. You're in for a treat on this one. And they are kind of not neat to watch, but I get it. Um, they're going to enshroud the earth with these satellites. And it's this, it's this panel right here, I believe, the solar panel is what's actually causing the, the, the illumination. They're relatively small, but I mean, against the blackness of space, you can't shield them. You may not be able to see them with your naked eye, but professional telescopes, if you have a Rubin scope and it comes online, it's going to see every one of them. And that's bad. What's it going to do for radio astronomy? That's another good question. Yeah, I don't know. It's, that's another issue to, to, to worry about. Yeah, it's, it's certainly going to have some effect on that as well. What about human space flight? If, if these things are whizzing through low Earth orbit, like the space station mm -hmm. and the Chinese space station, how many potential collisions are we going to see? If you do the calculation of the volume of space below Earth orbit, it's pretty big. But if you fill it with 100,000 satellites or more, they get pretty crowded. You know, I always, I always tease that, you know, when you make your little satellite icons here, the size of Rhode Island, it gets pretty crowded pretty fast, right? These are little satellites. But when you fill up that volume of space with them, and they're, they're gonna, it's going to get crowded up there. You won't be able to look at the telescope anywhere without seeing satellites. So, and this was an early picture. I think it was um, published intentionally. They aimed it, they knew where the Starlink train was going to go by. They imaged this. Um, this is a Hickson compact group. I can't remember which one it is. Um, but there they are, crossing through the field of view. And that's, that's the dilemma. Love them or hate them. I don't think they're going to go away, and I think the imagers, the professionals, I imagine the pros will have will have computers that will be able to say to the telescope, stop, okay, go now, when they know a satellite will cross the field of view. The amateurs won't be far behind. If you're taking subs and you want, you're going to throw away, you think you might throw away 10% of them, take 10% take, take more. There must be software packages. I'm, I'm not an imager, so I don't know. But there must be. It seems crazy that I'm the first guy to think of this. Put a cursor over here, put a cursor over there, and everything that's along that line, they could go away, please, to clean up those images. I know it takes away some meaning from data, but that might be a way to eliminate start satellite trails on your on your images. But I get it, I get it. They're everywhere. They're gonna, it's gonna get way worse. But anyway, that all remains to be seen. But anyway, how to be a successful satellite observer. Whenever you're outside of the night sky, look up. Right? Look up. I missed more stuff looking through my telescope. I was up in Maine back in August, and there was a meteor that all I know is standing here looking at the oh, telescope, yeah. I could see my shadow on the ground. <laughs> so I don't know how bright that was, but I didn't see it. But I, I, I turned in time, it was a person. I, I turned in time to see the, the train fade away, and the folks with cameras were like, put a camera on that spot, and you'll see the, the smoke trail wafting away in the uh, upper atmosphere. So look up. The darker your sky, the better. Of course, wear comfortable clothing. If it's winter time, bundle up. Uh, if you want to lay down, get a blanket. Remember to bring insect repellent. Ticks are everywhere. Mosquitoes are even worse. Um, get a list if you want to start checking them off. You have to print off, a, print off that time schedule. From heavensabove.com, use your phone for time. Of course, a red flashlight so you don't lose your way in the dark. Binoculars are optional. And of course, be patient. Sometimes there's a gap of time between satellites. And you know, you'll just look at the sky and let the sky offer what it will. Maybe you'll see meteors. Maybe you'll see something interesting. But um, I think that's where I'll end my talk tonight because it's already, you guys are probably, are, is he going to stop ever, please? Um, I, can, I could talk about this until the wee hours of the morning. So somebody just, I, 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 at Stella Fane, when I gave my talk, I was like, somebody just go like this when there's like five minutes left. <laughs> just give me a heads up so I'll know to stop. And I can, I can just talk about this stuff forever or anything else you want to talk about.
<laughs> anyway, um, that actually is the last slide. So, um, <laughs> that's all we've got. I, I love to give presentations. And um, I've done stuff for cellophane. I've done stuff for the conjunction, which is sadly no more um, um, for Aldrich, for you folks. So I love doing this stuff. I, I, I like sharing my enthusiasm for astronomy and all things astronomical. Um, I, I just love it. I, I, um, like Russ said, what I, I do now is I tinker with telescopes, spoil the grandkids, and, and observe. And um, every, you know, we only have so many clear nights, right? Uh, in a lifetime, and so um, don't don't squander them watching like The Bachelor on TV or something like that. Three runs of the Kardashians. Three runs of the Kardashians. Of course, so there's Netflix. Of course, there's Netflix. But um, it's fun. I, you know, they're out there. I mean, I, ever since, like I said, I was a little kid when there were very few satellites in the sky. We used to love to watch them because hey, there's a satellite. You just wouldn't see them very often because there were maybe a dozen or so in the sky. But now. Gosh, I mean, how many times do you look through your telescope at pick an object like M11 and satellites streak through the fields of view? All the time it happens, all the time. It's going to get worse. It's going to get worse.